I'm talking today to Gordon Shepherd, coach of the Scottish ladies team, and uh, we're covering the winning team interview. Uh, I've done this interview with pretty well every top coach in the world over the last few years. Uh, I asked them a series of questions. The questions have changed slightly, but uh, they're basically the same. And um, what it does is it allows us to see how the philosophy of a particular coach marries up with the success of that coach in relation to their performance and to the other top coaches in the world. So, uh, Gordon Shepherd, or Shep, Shep, as you are affectionately known. Um, Shep, what are the critical factors in creating a winning hockey team? It, time is, a, is one, and uh, time on task. Um, having contact with the players for large periods of time you, know, you can make huge strides and I think that's why some of the top coaches in the world and the top teams in the world, they're full time, they have that and it's very difficult for the smaller nations to achieve that sort of um, to close the gap on the top teams um, but we work particularly hard on you know, a lot of training individual sessions, contact time in small groups, evening sessions and then we have our national sessions so it, for me it's time it's time and, con and contact with the players Okay um, in the modern game, there's a fair bit of emphasis on the drag flicker. How important is it to have a specialist drag flicker? Yeah, I think you can see, you know, I think it's more important in the men's game. I think in the women's game there are less and less uh, world-class drag flickers. There are the, the top countries, and you know, let's say Holland and Argentina, Australia with Jody Kenny, you know, they, they have them. Yes. And we would love one. Yes. Um, and we did have... We, one in Nikki Kidd a few years ago. She was very, very good and scored a lot of goals for us. And we found it hard to develop a, uh, another one to, to back her up. And if you look at uh, also, it's not easy. If you look at England and GB, yeah. they have struggled to find one from to replace Krista Cullen from 2012. I know they brought her back for 2016, but she, no, she scored any corners. You know, so it's, it's very difficult. You can't just say, well, we want the next drag flicker because many people can drag flick, but under pressure at the top level, it's very, very difficult. So we have to. We, we spend a lot of time on our corner options. Yes. Um, we have a couple of good girls off the top, um, but we must have our other options. But uh, we're always on the lookout, you know, for youngsters who have that potential and to try and then spend time developing uh, the drag flight for us for the for the senior team for the future. Mm. Okay, um, team selection. Now in Scotland, uh, I don't know how deep your pool of players is over there, but. Whether it's a club, whether it's a, a, a national team or whatever it is, when you're selecting a side, it always comes down to the very last two places in any team. How do you select that final position? You've got two players, you've narrowed it right down, you've got two people left, and you've got to decide between those two. How are you going to select between those two? Well, if we just take our most recent um, warm weather camp, we had in Gran Canaria, the whole squad, well, I say whole squad, we cut it down to 27 before we went away. And we were clear that it, that selection was going to be based on how they performed in that camp, not how they performed a year or two years ago. Yep. They had to be on forum to be selected. Right. Um, and selection is, all, you're right, it's always difficult, it's never clear cut, and if it's clear cut you'd be wondering why. Uh, and you've then got to, the, when you come down to the final two, you, know, you spend a lot of time going back, looking over the video to see what they've done in their training sessions. And then you also got to look at the balance and the makeup of the squad. You know, wh where do you where do you see your strengths and for us our selection for the first time we've come with six midfielders because the midfield line is extremely strong and we've left a couple of good midfielders at home as well yes so we decided to load our midfield and come and then just have five backs and five forwards with the potential within that midfield that they can move lines if required due yeah. to injury so there are a lot of factors we take into it but the, the most of all we try now and pick the best players and we we did in this occasion again pick the best 18 plus our two travelling reserves for this tournament. Lovely. Okay, you've selected your team, you've filled your last spot, something's not going well on the field, uh, maybe in training, maybe on the field, maybe during the game, and you've got to talk to that player, counsel them, criticise them, call it what you like, you've got to have words. Uh, how do you do that? I think you've got to, again, balance. I mean, the, quite often players hear the criticism and not necessarily the praise. Yeah. And uh, I think it's important that they hear both, because you know at the time when in the heat of a game or the heat of a training session they're tired, they're emotional, uh, and the reaction to the negative can be quite tough. Yeah. So you have to then make sure that you can back it up with positive as well, because it's not everything that they're doing is bad. It might just be one thing that needs yeah. an improvement. So it could be their focus, just a clear, you know, focus on what they should do on the, uh, in the next time of possession. But not be scared to make that criticism to a player because ultimately the criticism 
is to help the player and therefore help the team. Um, but I think praise goes a long way as well. I think when players are consistently doing well, you know, don't take it for granted. Continually say to them, you know, that they're, that this is great. You know, there might be other things you can do, but this is really good, and we want you to keep going in this in this uh, line. So um, it's a balance between criticism and backing it up with praise. Okay. Now, you just talked then about loading the midfield for this particular tournament, and that brings me on to my next point, which is we used to see a very um, defined relationship between forwards, midfielders, and defence. These days, the, are a lot, the lines are a lot more blurred. So uh, we're seeing all-round players. In, in Australia, for example, in the men's team, you'll find Mark Knowles, traditionally a full-back up there yeah. in the forward line. Chris Cirillo as well. Suddenly, he'll pop up in the opposition D. So we're having to create an all-round player these days. How do you go about creating the all-round player? Well, they, 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 in any draw, they don't just, if defenders don't just defend. You know, defenders have to attack as well. And yep. we, we do that in, we, in our training. And I think we, we encourage players all the time to uh, not be scared to go forward. And so I, I'm, I have no concerns about the defender popping up in the, in the D and scoring a goal. I don't care who scores the goals, yes. as long as somebody scores the goals. <laughs> uh, and in the same respect, we spend a lot of time on our defensive structure, uh, and the forwards are back there in the D, and they have to be disciplined enough that they don't expose themselves to giving away cheap corners. So every player you know, must be able to have an aspect of the game opposite to what they are supposedly called. So a forward must have a defensive aspect of the game because most of the time they'll probably spend it defending might not be in the D but they might be the first person there in a press yep. and that's where the defence starts and as for defenders yeah, defenders need to have the composure that when they are they may be given a, given a pass inside and the space is on the outside and they've led to that that they have to keep going and, and the recognition of the rest of the team is to fill the space in behind so there is no rules uh, for us to say that, no, that any player can't go forward or and then there is one rule that all players must work back. So, um, yeah, we, we do that in training. We encourage everybody to do everything. Oh, good. So you're talking of every player working back and, and the like. Uh, so when a player receives the ball, what's the very first thing that they should do? Well, yeah, we'd say is the first, when they receive the ball, the first thing that they, they're going to do is uh, they must concentrate on that first touch and putting the ball exactly where they want to put it to be able to give the next option. There's no point if you're going forward and you trap a ball to your right when it needs to be outside your left foot to give the next pass. So uh, I think that you know, for, if they can make, concentrate on their pick-up, have done their pre-scan and know what they want to do with it, and if that passes up, give that pass quickly. And I'm not talking about the pace of the pass. The pace of the pass is important. It's the quickness that they get the pass there, not taking three touches when two will do. Yep. Um, and that's what we talk about again, putting the ball where it needs to be so we can quickly give that pass and not slow the play down because we want to play fast attacking hockey. OK. Um, short corners, let me take you to the short corner now. Every team, and I've seen you doing it here during this tournament, reviews the um, attacking short corner. I see the signal coming out from the bench. Do you actually change or review your defensive short corner live during each match? Do you, in other words, do you adapt? Do you have a, a system for doing that? Uh, we tend, no, uh, not, not for me. The goalkeepers are the ones that are in charge of the short corner defence and they call the systems that they want run. Um, we have spent a lot of time in the last three years working on our defensive corner set, set up and we are extremely proud of our success rate in doing so in top tournaments. Um, and we, we're looking at, you know, sometimes countries want an 80%. You're saying we want to be getting better than 80% success rate in defence. Um, so we work, we work on tiny, tiny, uh, you talk on inches, play, yes. where a player's foot is, you know, depending on which castle it's trapped at, the running angle of the, the number one runner, and you know, being brave, and, you know, and, and if it means yes. that you get hit, you get hit, and that's, that's part and parcel of it. So we spend a lot of time doing that. We have extremely good number one runners now. We have extremely good players in behind them. And the keepers will be the ones, ultimately, who will read what is happening at the top of the D, recognise where the threats might possibly come from, and they'll change their systems. We won't run the same system every single corner. No. You know, we, because eventually you'll get caught. And if I go back to you know, the Queensland team from game one to game two, they ran exactly the same system. And that's why we were able to score the very first corner we had in game two, because we knew the space would be there. Yeah. So I think if you are that predictable, teams, world-class teams will find those gaps and, you, and you've got to be flexible in your systems. Mm. Uh, finally, the game of hockey changes. I mean, it's constantly changing, has been for <laughs> many, many years. Uh, if you could change one rule in hockey, what would you change and why? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily a rule that I would change. I think that there are certain, especially in the men's game, there's a huge danger element now in corners. Yeah, I'll make know? an improvement. Yeah, 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 well, make a change. The, the one, I'll be honest, okay, but even if we move away from corners, yeah. in, in, in the indoor game, you're not allowed to drill the ball anymore. Yeah. But you come to the outdoor game, and you can absolutely smash it through somebody who's within that distance. And that's not skill, that's just smashing the ball through somebody. And the, the reason of the rule change was for safety and to uh, improve skill levels in the indoor game. And I think that from a danger point of view, there's yeah. too many people getting smashed hands nowadays. Yeah. Um, so I, I would look to bring that rule in, the no drilling rule. Um, and from uh, on the short corners, I've had a lot of talk about you know, the danger element. We, the ball has to hit the backboard if you're hitting it, but it doesn't if you're flicking it. And nowadays, some of these guys, they can flick the ball faster than some people used to be able to hit it. So for me, I think you know, the short corner rule where the drag flick even has to hit the, the backboard, or if it's a bigger board maybe, but you know, from a safety element, somebody's going to get seriously hurt standing yeah. on the line or running those corners down. And until uh, the, governing, uh, the governance of our sport look at that, you know, let's, let's hope they get it sorted before somebody gets seriously hurt. Shep, it's uh, wonderful talking to you. Um, good luck with the Commonwealth Games. Uh, I know your girls are looking pretty sharp. I've just seen you run them there pretty hard for two hours. So um, I don't know, I haven't seen the other teams practicing yet, but I'd say that you'd been with a, a reasonably solid chance of improving on your fifth place at the last Commonwealth Games, just looking at what I've seen on the field so far. So all the very best for that, and thanks for visiting us here in Australia. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers, Okay.